You're watching the Sermon of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would at this time, take your Bibles and turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus 3, we'll be looking at verses 8 through 11. Titus 3, verses 8 through 11. We've seen the Apostle Paul here in his letter to Titus already address the idea of false teachers. And here again, he's going to get back into that thought, uh, addressing even what is the outcome of false teaching in many ways. But I think that we need to really consider this and understand the warnings that are in the New Testament of false teaching within the church and, and how it can worm its way in and, and very casually and uh, very uh, just making us unaware as it can come in among us. And so we must be aware and understanding of taking everything back to the scriptures, everything we hear, everything uh, that we go over, whether it's here or something you hear on the radio or whatever it is, bring it back to the authority of God's word and say, is this what God's word says? And standing there on that truth. So we have to understand the danger. Charles Spurgeon once said, the greatest sorrow of the church have been brought upon her not by the arrow shot by her foes, not by the discharge of the artillery of hell, but by fires lit in her own midst, by those who have crept into her in the guise of good men and true, but who were spies in the camp and traitors to the cause. False teachers don't come with big signs saying, hey, we're false teachers, look at us. And very often they don't come in with just the blatant Things that we all can recognize and point to as heresies and saying, oh, well, you know, we, don't, we deny Jesus was God. We completely throw that out. No, they, they don't come in so overtly. No, they, they come in and, and they, they seem as, as good orthodox followers of Christ. And they can, yet in that way, worm their way in and just bring in subtle teachings that can grow and grow and, and have an effect and take an influence. And, and so we, again, always must be aware and be taking things back to and testing against the authority of God's word. Last week we saw the attitudes that Paul said should be in the church. This includes sub, a submissive attitude to obey the governing authorities, ready for every good work. And then an attitude towards others uh, of being peaceable and gentle uh, speaking evil of no one and showing perfect courtesy towards all people, without exception, towards all people, even those who are not very courteous and kind and gentle towards us. And why should we do this? Why should we be courteous towards people who are rude to us, who are cruel towards us? Why should we have a submissive attitude, looking to submit to the government everywhere possible, recognizing that there may be times where it is not possible? Or where we submit to Christ first in all things, but looking always, no matter what, to submit where we can, having a submissive attitude. Why should we respond to a government that we may strongly disagree with? Why may we respond to a government with an attitude of submission when we feel they have not done much good for us? And why should Christians all over the world, even facing t such tyranny that many do, have an attitude of submission? Why should we... Be so kind to others who have not been kind to us. Because the truth of the matter is, you and I, no matter what wickedness is around us and out there, you and I have not been really any better. We have not been any less wicked in of ourselves, especially towards our Creator. I myself know better I myself, one who spit in the face of the one who created me for himself and living for myself, and yet he showed me such kindness and goodness, such mercy in saving me. And so we see as we come to our text here for this morning, and we look at verses 8 through 11. In verse 8, Paul refers back to what 
we read last week as a trustworthy saying, and that Titus was to insist on all that we read Paul said last week for the purpose of good works. And then as we come to verse 9, we have what, instead of what Titus is to insist on, we see the things that the church is to avoid altogether. And then verses 10 through 11, we have the false teachers or a divisive person and how they're to be dealt with. And so let's go to our text here for this morning, Titus chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So now as we see here, Paul has pointed at the Christians, those who are saved, including himself as we saw back in verse 3, including each one of us, with all the doctrine that Paul had gone over there in verses 3 through 7, he then refers back to this gospel truth here in verse 8, as a trustworthy saying or a trustworthy word. That we were so foolish and disobedient. And to sum up everything that we saw him say last week there in verse 3, we were wretches in every way. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. He cleansed us and he changed us by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This, Paul says, is a trustworthy saying. And so Paul told Titus that all that comes from this trustworthy word, the attitudes that are based in the gospel truths, He wanted Titus to insist on them. Again, like we saw last week, what Paul was instructing here about one's attitudes towards governing authorities and one's attitude towards people in general is not an option. If we are followers of Christ, if we have been saved by such mercy, then these things must be found in us in growing measure. They must be found in our lives, in our attitudes. It's not an option. Paul told Titus to insist on these things. Which, since these things are based in the gospel, it takes remembering the gospel. It takes remembering who we once were and now who we are in Jesus Christ. It takes depending on that saving grace that, as we read a few weeks ago, trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we are eagerly waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul said, Titus, you need to insist on these things. Having received such kindness and such mercy from God, having been given such a great salvation... Me, a wretched sinner, that I must turn around and give such kindness to others, even those who have not been kind towards me. That's what we are called to. And the gospel calls us to such living, and we should walk in a manner worthy of our calling, which we have been called. So insist on these things. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to engage, or as the ESV has here, devote themselves to good works. So everything Paul has said about the attitude we should have towards governing authorities and people in general is so that we will engage in good works. And so that we will live out the gospel truths in what we do, 
and in how we live towards other people, towards the world around us. So God's grace, the mercy in which he saved us, shapes us and conforms us all the more into Christ-likeness, into the likeness of our God, as we treat others like he treated us, doing what is excellent and profitable for people. And this is what it looks like to live godly and upright lives in this present age, as Paul said. So keep the gospel always before you. Hear the gospel over and over. Read God's word and be motivated to keep it and obey it, motivated by the gospel. That you have not had to earn your right standing before God, because you can't, but it has been earned for you. That you've already been saved. You don't have to work to be saved. You've been saved according to God's mercy if you are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. And if you're sitting here saying, yes, I have trusted in Christ. I have been saved by God's mercy. Then, my friends, is the gospel shaping your attitudes? Is it shaping your attitude towards others and how you live? The gospel is not a means of taking away our problems in this life, of making it so we can live the life we always wanted. But instead, the gospel is the means by which we respond in godliness in the midst of struggles. And specifically here are struggles with others, with people and government, that we would look out for what is in the best interest of others, even before our own interests. Even for those who it's hard to care about their interests because they're hard to live with. The gospel shapes our attitude towards them. It's like what we read in the gospel of Luke. What Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 verses 32 to 35. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. It doesn't take being regenerated, being made new in the Holy Spirit, to be kind to those who are kind to you. It doesn't take the power of God within you to treat well those who treat you well. That's not supernatural. That's not the power of the gospel. Sinners do that, as Jesus said. But the gospel calls us to a, a higher living. The gospel calls us to something greater. Jesus said here, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. You know, sons usually want to be like their father, right? You know, you can walk into any random second grade classroom and pick any random boy in that classroom and ask him what he wants to be when he grows up, and there's a pretty good chance you're going to find out what his father does for a living. Because what is usual is for sons who want to be like their father. And so if we have been adopted into the family of God, if we have been saved, shouldn't we want to be like our Father? Shouldn't we be striving to be like our God? And we know that our Heavenly Father is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. We know this because He was kind to us when He saved us. And don't we want to be like Him in everything that we do? So the gospel motivates and shapes our attitude towards others. That we would do the things that are profitable for others. That we would live in a godly way, even in this wicked world. And then as we come to verse 9, we see a contrast. A contrast between the good works that Paul wants the church to be ready to perform which flow from sound doctrine, which flow from the gospel that shapes our attitudes. We see this contrast with that which is excellent and profitable for people, 
as opposed to that which is not excellent and profitable. Namely, that which comes from not sound doctrine, but unsound doctrine. That which comes from false teaching. So Paul returns again to this issue of false teachers. And Paul here commands that those who have believed in God be careful to devote themselves to good works, that they are to avoid what is coming from false teachers. Avoid the things that are a product of false teaching. And we see here the first thing he mentions is foolish controversies. This refers to inquiries or questions that are worthless. A matter of fact, the King James translates this as foolish questions. And the word here that the ESV translates as controversies and the King James translates as questions, in the Greek-English lexicon known as BDAG, it, it gives the definition as a search for information, investigation. So again, that's why the King James translates it as questions. So as we think of this being foolish questions, uh, uh, we know the saying that there is no such thing as a stupid question, right? We know that saying, and, and, you know, for the most part, it's right, right? But we've all sat in a classroom with a student that has to ask a question not because they really have a question, but because they they have to show off in some way how how smart they are, how deep they're thinking, or, or they're just trying to, you know, nuzzle in tight with the teacher and be on their good side and and look good. In other words, they ask questions that have ulterior motives. And so too, I think these are questions that Paul is referring to that have ulterior motives. Those who are raising questions not so that they can learn or to help others learn, not for any profit for any reason, but are asking questions in order to raise questions, to usurp authority, to cause division, To have it their way instead of being submissive to God's word or to God's appointed leaders. They are foolish questions. And therefore these stupid or foolish questions uh, relate to the next three things very closely that Paul mentions here. And these things must be dealt with. And we must respond to them rightly. And we even see Paul talking about such things in his second letter to Timothy, which he would write sometime after writing to Titus. And we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, he says, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. They cause problems within the church. They break up the unity and harmony within the church. And there's supposed to be unity within the church. Yes, unity that is, sur- that is around truth. Absolutely. But even still, there are some things due to being tertiary issues that are just not worth diving into and bringing up and, and fighting over. That the unity in the essential truths of the gospel, the things that are crystal clear in Scripture, is where, where we must gather around and hold together as brothers and sisters in Christ, standing on these things. That we're to be unified in these things. And again, sure, there are things in Scripture that are hard to understand. There are things in Scripture that are, are difficult to, to piece together. But the majority of Scripture is clear. That we know God has revealed his truth, and we know what his truth is and what he is saying. We're to stand on those things. And yet, throughout history, professing Christians have shown a tendency to divide over, forget tertiary things, uh, things that aren't even on the radar of importance. And what does that look like to a watching world? I just read an article this week by Tom Askell, uh, called Church Splits. And he said this, Francis Schaeffer warned of the damning impact that divisiveness in the church has on uh, on evangelism. The world looks, shrugs its shoulders, and turns away. It has not seen even the beginning of a living church in the midst of a dying culture. It has not seen the beginning of what Jesus indicated is the final apologetic, observable oneness among true Christians who are truly brothers in Christ. 
No wonder the Bible places great emphasis on church unity and warns so strongly against church divisiveness. Nothing less than the glory of God, the spiritual health of believers, and the advance of the gospel are at stake when a church's unity is threatened. Again, there are certain things that we must divide over. Absolutely. But we must be cautious about what we divide over. That we divide over that which is essential truth. That we divide over the things that threaten the unity in the church. We divide over the things that, not, that are not of God. The things that are of gospel importance. And we must rid ourselves of all that causes disunity. And so we see here, we get a little window into the things that were going on on the island of Crete while Titus was there at that time. And there were things causing disunity and and false teaching and the product of that going on in the church there. And so Paul says to avoid those things, avoid foolish controversies, avoid genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Don't engage them, avoid them. And whatever all is in reference with these things, at the very least, it's pretty clear that Jewish myths and traditions are what's in view here. Remember when we were in chapter 1, and we read in verse 10, Paul said, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. And as we discuss that verse there in chapter 1, we discuss that it would seem that the false teachers on the island of Crete must have been Judaizers. Uh, those who undermine the gospel of grace by adding works of the law to it. Now, yeah, you, you need Jesus to be saved, you need what he did, but he's not enough. You have to add your own works of the law to him. That, that undermines the true gospel of grace. And the reason that Paul gives for commanding that these things be avoided is, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And so again, these are in contrast to the good works that come out of sound teaching, which are excellent and profitable for people. What comes from false teachers is not profitable. It's worthless. And just as there, are, there were foolish controversies and pitfalls in Paul and Titus' day that threatened the unity of the church, there are pitfalls and controversies in our day that we could easily fall in that could threaten the unity of the church around essential truth and around sound doctrine. We must avoid such controversies. We must avoid such disunity. We must avoid such things as majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. We must avoid any interpretation of God's word that would seem as if we can't really know exactly what God's word communicates to us. That we can't get to the truth. That it's just up to each one's individual interpretation. God's word is clear. We must avoid any, anything that would misrepresent a mishandling of the scriptures and bending the scriptures towards our own preferences and opinions. We must search the scriptures, confident that in them lies the will of God. And that God has clearly communicated his will to his church. And so that we would submit ourselves to whatever God's word says. Avoid dissension, avoid arguments over what is unimportant and what is not true. And so avoid what is unprofitable and worthless. Avoid what causes division, what threatens the unity of the church. And so we see in verse 10, for a person who continues in these pitfalls, causing division and fractions, Paul says, after warning them once, And then twice, have nothing to do with them. You know, we can spend a lot of time getting caught up 
and controversy and getting caught up, caught up in, in, in the questions that are, are meant to divide and debating with others about areas of doctrine that are clearly wrong from Scripture. But Paul does not say, spend your time arguing with the false teacher. Spend your time trying to convince somebody. Paul says, warn them once, warn them twice, and then have nothing to do with them. There is better things we can do with our time, right? Uh, There are those with soft hearts that are longing to know God's word and want to grow in his word that we can be investing ourselves into. There are those whom God is working in their hearts to draw them to himself as he calls us to go and proclaim the gospel. We shouldn't waste our time with those who are unteachable. We shouldn't try to chip away at hardened hearts that will not crack. Paul says don't do that. When someone is causing division, getting people to follow them by meaningless arguments and speculation, such a one is a divisive person. And Paul says warn them once, warn them twice, and have nothing to do with them. And what Paul is advocating here is church discipline. Paul commands. It's a command to have nothing to do with them. To disassociate from them. Obviously, if a person is warned once and they repent, then things do not need to go any further. Or if it takes warning them twice for them to repent, it's too bad. But nonetheless, if they've repented after two warnings, then the matter's done with. And we move on. But if after two warnings, this divisive one still will not repent, then they are to be disciplined. And why? Well, because we recognize the seriousness of the matter. The testimony of the church in holding to the unity is at stake. And so, too, the dangers of of letting the divisive false teacher with worthless speculations continue on is a danger to themselves. It's not good for them. It's a serious matter, and we must show them the seriousness of their lack of repentance. It's the loving thing to do. And, two, to allow a divisive person to continue on in their divisiveness, again, is a danger to the church. It's a danger to all of us here together, striving to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And so it's not loving to the church as a whole to allow someone to continue on. They must be dealt with. We must see the seriousness of the matter. Warn them once, warn them twice, and then disassociate from them. Have nothing to do with them. Paul says, for such a person who is so stubborn, refusing to repent. Verse 11, he says they're warped. You could say they're perverted, morally turned aside. He says they're sinful, or literally could be translated as that he keeps on sinning. His error has been made known to him, and so he is responsible. He is self-condemned. As if after being warned, he continues in his divisive ways. He will not listen to the warnings. He will not submit to the authority of God's word, the authority that he is under. The danger they are to themselves and to the church, they must be dealt with. I mean, what did Paul say in chapter 1 about false teachers? In chapter 1, verse 11, we read there, they must be silenced. Since they are upsetting whole families by teaching shameful, for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. They must be silenced. They must be dealt with. One for their own sake, two for the sake of the church. And I keep pressing for their own sake and for the sake of the church because whenever we talk about church discipline, there's always that kickback of saying that that's, that's so unloving. It's so unloving to have nothing to do with them. Why would, why would you treat someone that way? But it is the very opposite. It is the loving thing to do. And listen, you know, as we, we talked about 
looking to have a plurality of elders, which is the right thing to do. And so when we have those elders, or right now, myself specifically, here for North Valley, I'm the one who is going to stand before the Lord to give an account for how I have protected the church. To protect it from false teachers and those who are divisive. This is the responsibility of Christ under shepherds, of faithful under shepherds. And yet, too, at the same time, we all have responsibility in this as well. To take everything we hear back to the scriptures and test it against the scriptures. Because the scriptures are our authority. Not our tradition, not our upbringings, not our opinions, not things that sound nice. The scriptures. This is God's word. And we test everything here. And so we must, in that fashion, deal with false teaching. Deal with divisiveness over foolish things in the church. If we were to look through Paul's letters and look at Paul's ministry, we would see many warnings about false teachers. We would see many warnings about those who cause division. And I would argue that those who the Bible describes as being divisive is pretty clear. And what we see here in Titus and in other letters by Paul is that false teaching divides, but is the truth of God's word that brings unity in the church. On this, John MacArthur said this. He said, Evangelicals who adhere strictly but unpretentiously to the inerrancy of Scripture and refuse to join ranks with those who claim to be Christians but who compromise or denigrate God's word are often wrongly accused of being divisive. But God's true church is bonded by his word and the power of his indwelling spirit who applies and builds the church on, on and through that word. The ones who truly cause destructive divisions and disharmony, the ungodly dissensions and hindrances, are those who promote and practice falsehood and unrighteousness. No institution or movement can rightly claim unity in Christ if they are not unified in and by his word. Whatever spiritual unity they may have is based on the spirit of this age, which is satanic, not godly. The right response of believers to false teachers, especially those who teach their heresy under the guise of Christianity, is not debate or dialogue. We are to turn away from them, to reject what they teach, and to protect fellow believers, especially new converts, and the immature from being deceived, confused, and misled. Paul often argued and debated with unbelievers, both Jews and Gentiles. He did not, however, provide a platform for those who profess Christ, but taught a false and perverted gospel. Protecting against false doctrine is so vital to the health and the unity of the church. This is undoubtedly a loving thing to do. And going along with what MacArthur said, I had read recently, um, I don't remember where I read it or, or who said it, uh, but they were talking about the fact that when you read the scriptures, the one standing for true doctrine, even in standing for true doctrine, calling out the false doctrine, that one is never accused of being divisive. The one who is guilty of being divisive in the Bible is always the false teacher. Always. And I think, especially in our day, that's something we need to consider and think on. Because we live in a day that whenever we speak the truth, we're the ones called divisive. But that's not where the Bible stands. Even when we call out what is false and what is wrong, it's the false teacher. It's those promoting false doctrines that are divisive. The church is unified under sound doctrine, under committing to God's word as our authority in our lives. We must hold firm to God's word. We must hold firm to the true gospel and have nothing to do with anything that comes against it, that contradicts it. I think here too, is he, the things that he lists and how he describes these things as... They're worthless. 
that we see here those who take trivial things and divide the church by making them essential things also qualifies as a divisive person. Trivial things, false teaching here in this text, these things are not worth debating, not worth arguing over. Instead, they are to be avoided. Those who cause division are to be silenced, having nothing to do with such a one. We are to disassociate with them. As Paul told Timothy, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Meaning that in the church, it's God's people, his redeemed people, who hold up and proclaim the truth, who proclaim the gospel to the world. And we do this with our words and with our lives, as we see both there in 1 Timothy and here in Titus. And that's why as we look at the behaviors of the church and how the church is to be, and the idea of qualified leaders in the church is all so vital. Everything we've seen so far in Titus is vital to these things. It's so important. We need to protect the church, protect North Valley and the unity here by biblically dealing with false teaching and divisive people. And again, it is the elder's job especially. I mean, all we have to do is look to Acts 20 as Paul was warning about the false teachers that would rise up among their own number. And it was the, the shepherds, the elders that were to protect the church. Those who will give an account before Jesus. But we all have responsibility in protecting the church and being faithful to God's word. Standing on the truth of God's word, standing on the gospel, being reminded of the gospel time and time again, reminding, remembering who we were, and yet God was so kind to us in saving us by his mercy in cleansing us and regenerating us by the Holy Spirit that he poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. And letting those truths shape our attitudes. And in shaping our attitudes, be ready for every good work. Be ready in standing on truth. Standing together as a church in unity on those truths. As we live doing the things that are excellent and profitable for people and avoiding the things that are not excellent and profitable. Are we here at North Valley committed to that? Are we committed to doing all that is excellent and profitable for people and avoiding what is not? Standing on sound doctrine and calling out and disassociating with false teaching. That our commitment to the word of God. Let's pray. Father. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nvbc.com.